Hello everybody and welcome to round number two of the European Team Chess Championship 2017 here from Hersonisos in Crete, in Greece, which is a country in Europe. We will shortly kick off and today has been the day where almost all teams have decided, okay, we gave our top players a rest on day one. Some of them paid a price for it. Azerbaijan most prominently lost their match to Italy while they rested world number four, Shah Mohamed Yarov. But today all the big guns are in action. Levon Aronian, world number two, has his first outing for Armenia facing the Greek top team. Greece, as the organizers, has three teams in this competition. And while Greece too did pretty well yesterday, this time around it is Greece one's opportunity to pull off an upset facing Armenia, who are perennial favorites, I don't know what that word means, but I'll use it, to do well in such an event. Shall we jump right into the action? I think the game's just started. Levon Aronian on the top board against Yanis Papayanu, bit of a legend of Greek chess, has been around forever. I should be careful calling him old. I don't think he's old, he's probably my age, because yesterday I said Yanis Nikolaidis, playing for Greece too, has been around forever. And I ran into him on the way here. It was a very awkward encounter. So, Yanis Papayanu, a youthful top player for Greece, facing in one of the toughest tasks there is in world chess. The black pieces versus Levan Aronian on board one. We shall see how the Greek squad does. There's other encounters that I'm intrigued by today. For example, the Dutch Holland is facing Ukraine. The is Ukraine the number three seed? Yeah, I believe Ukraine is the number three seed. That, for example, means that Anish Giri is playing fellow 2700 player Pavel Elyanov on the top board. And it also means that Luke Van Veli, who I've seen at breakfast this morning, gets his first chance at coaching his team against a tough opponent. Luke Van Veli, the legend of Dutch chess, is here as their captain. There's literally tens of other strong grandmaster games at display that we see the cameras kicking in we of course will not be able to cover all the action there's too many games for that but whenever something exciting happens we'll make sure to jump there fiona Steele anthony will be joining us later she's out in the field taking pictures tweeting doing all kinds of stuff while we are getting a look at the greece one team there we have stelius halkias on board number four playing against Khan Melkumyan. What was he? I believe European Blitz champion? Is that Melkum Jan's biggest title? I believe so. Very solid 2650 player on board 4 for Armenia. Board 3 we see Gabriel Sargisyan. Yes, I have to look this name up because he's new, at least to me, to the scene. Antonios Pavlidis, 2550 Grandmaster on board 3 for Greece. On 2 we have Christos Banikas against Sege Mofsesian. Those guys have been around forever. Probably similar age, I would guess both are born in 78, maybe not 79, not 100% sure, but I know Banikas was slightly older than me in these youth competitions, where Halkias, who's my age, played in the same events normally. And on board one, we can't see them from here, there's Papayano versus Levon Aronian, Levon Aronian with the white pieces, who is arguably the dominating player of 2017 has won a lot of stuff the Grand chess classic norway chess the world cup the st louis rap and blitz he also got married this year and i believe the first lady of armenia sang at his wedding so he's been running from success to success and he tends to do very well for the national team for armenia as well let's have a look at the opening against papayano c4 e5 and this has become a big oops this has become a big question after c4, e5. Do you play 2, g3 or do you play 2, knight, c3? With 2, knight, c3, you allow a lot of bishop, b4 based systems. That only makes sense if there's a knight to exchange here. But with 2, g3, you do allow the move c7 to c6 that has become very fashionable. Mainly because people have realized that after d4, which was considered to be the antidote, antidote? Black can go e5, e4 and tend to grab more space with d5 and get a reasonably pleasant game. Therefore, the white players have switched after c6 to playing knight to f3, which is what Aronian does in this game. 
and after e4, knight d4, d5, we have sort of a 2c3 Sicilian with colors reversed, if that makes sense. Um, we have something very similar to lines like this. But of course, with the difference that there's already a white pawn on g3. That's what happens d5, c takes d5, queen takes d5, knight to c2. All of this has been played before. White, I believe, has been struggling to get an opening advantage out of these positions. Black typically plays knight of 6, queen to h5, early bishop to c5, and yeah, knight of 6 has already been played. Knight to c3, queen to h5, and knight to e3. Now, I'm not 100% sure, I believe bishop c5 is the most popular move in these positions. We will certainly see who's winning this theory debate here between Levan Aronia and Yanis Papayan. Port number two, we have the aforementioned Panikas. Has been a very, very solid player for a long time, always hovering around 2600 against Sergei Mofsezian, who I believe his biggest rating was in the 2750 realm. He hasn't quite been able to keep that up, but he is always a force to be reckoned with, especially on these Armenian teams. He used to represent, I hope I don't get this wrong, the Czech Republic in the old days, but has, I don't know, for maybe 10 years now, been playing for Armenia here on board number two. Mofsesian plays a very solid Catalan mainline, a line that I know a little something about did a video series about this from the black point of view and after d takes c2 queen d takes c4 queen c2 he plays a move a6 which was also covered in my video series nowadays there's also the move b6 that was played for example by Jon Ludwig Hammer yesterday in his game against Boris Gelfand and has been gaining some steam but Mofsesian plays a6 and the theory nerds among us will keep a close eye on this game after a4 bishop to d7 is by far the most likely move to happen. a4 nowadays has pretty much replaced the old line with queen takes c4, b5, queen to c2, bishop b7, bishop d2, because I believe that black yeah, has quite some convincing ways to equalize here. Check my series for more details. Anyway, all the top players have started to play a4, just stopping b5, and now white is planning to put his bishop Black is playing to put his bishop on this long diagonal with bishop d7, bishop to c6. And then he has two plans. One is to, after white takes on c4, try to get in a quick c5. And the other is to play more slowly, play a5, knight to a6, knight to b4. We'll see what happens. Banikas plays a bit of a sideline here. He plays a move rook to d1. The main move, of course, is queen takes c4. Rook to d1 typically indicates that after bishop to c6, white is willing to temporarily sacrifice a pawn, knight to c3, you want to take on f3, bishop takes, and knight to c6. This is a line, bishop takes c6, b takes c6, where black is a pawn up, but gets a pretty rotten pawn structure. And white has been trying to claim a tiny advantage in these positions, starting with bishop to g5 or with pawn to a5. We'll see what happens. Interesting theoretical debate here. Gabriel Sargisian, always an interesting theoretician as well. Did a lot of work in the old days, was working a lot with and for Levan Aronian. And a force to be reckoned with, I recall in the, where was it? The Chess Olympiad in Dresden 2008, where, I hope memory serves me well, where the Armenians won, Sargisian was a completely unstoppable force, using tons of great ideas in the opening and putting together a huge score. Here we are, nine years later, he's still not an old man, he's, I believe, 34 years old. And Gabriel Sargisian still going strong for the Armenian national team. This position is one, this symmetrical Grunfeld business, where White has been trying all kinds of goofy things recently. I believe they're struggling a bit to get anywhere with c4 after both d takes c4 and pawn to c6. So all kinds of funky moves have appeared here. Knight bd2, pawn to c3, pawn to b3, pawn to a4, bishop to e3, bishop to f4. You name it, it's probably been played by Vladimir Kramnik against another world-class player. They are trying all kinds of things here. And Sargisian joins the experimentation with the move pawn to c3. One point, I think Kramnik had some game with b6 and now c4, now that this diagonal has been weakened. There was one line, therefore, like typically, I'm not an expert here. 
I'm not sure if it's typical to go knight bd7, but that's what Pavlidis did in this game. After knight bd7, white played bishop to f4, sometimes intending stuff like queen to c1, followed by either bishop to h6 or pawn to c4. It's it's a weird line, with a lot of subtleties. Sagis Young certainly looks like he knows what he's doing. Having a look around, more interested in the game on board number four there, in the Malcolm Young game. And if it's interesting enough for Sagis Young, it's interesting enough for us. Let's go there. Oh, I know this line. This is right up my alley. The good old Marshal. Most of the Armenians are big experts in the Marshal, which I pretty much call this position. The Marshal itself is c3 and pawn to d5. But all of the sidelines, in my mind, rank, run under Marshal as well. a4, a3, d3 and so on. Anyway, in this game c3 was played by Stelios Halkias. D5 played by Melkum Jan, of course Levon Aronian, pretty much the godfather of this position. Nowadays, Leiko and Aronian. I'm not sure if that's still true, there's so many, so many experts out there. Magnus Carlsen might be decent at this stuff by now as well. The biggest specialist on the Marshal, which typically starts with this line. And Halkias says, okay, I'm not that interested in finding out what you have up your sleeve here. I would rather play the move d4 instead. Which, as far as I know, is a bit of a draw offer against an opponent that's well prepared. This move 9 to d4, it's sort of asking black, have you done your homework? And if you have, I'm okay making a draw. Because here, after d takes e4, which Malcolm Young, who clearly has done his homework, wouldn't expect differently, blitzes out, knight takes e5, d takes e5, queen takes d1, bishop takes d1, and knight to d7. This is a well-known line where white can temporarily win a pawn, but it wouldn't do him much good. If you were to take on e4, black gets a lot of compensation with bishop b7, knight c5, rook d8, and so on. I think you start with knight c5, actually. Start with knight c5. So the main move is bishop to c2, and here black mainly has to show that he's done his homework with... I wish I had done my homework. Some Something along those lines. When white once again is a pawn up, but the black two bishops and lead in development. Normally make sure that white won't be able to capitalize on that extra pawn. Therefore, I would expect this game to end peacefully. Helkes plays rook takes e4, not bishop to c2. Rook takes e4, arguably a little more ambitious, but the white pieces are slightly awkward after knight to c5. And if you ask, your computer program of choice, it will tell you that black has full compensation for the pawn here. So, a bit of a theoretical debate on board number four and on the top two boards as well. The Armenians, always extremely well prepared in team competitions, take this very seriously. And I've mentioned yesterday for a nation of, I believe, around three million inhabitants, which is slightly bigger than my city, Hamburg, when it comes to inhabitants, they've achieved amazing, amazing success in chess, not just Levon Aronian individually, but also the national team winning a couple of Olympians, always a force to be reckoned with. One guy who is not quite Armenian, but has strong ties to Armenia, is Peter Leiko, who is married to the daughter of the Armenian coach who we just saw pacing on the screen, Arshak Petrosyan. <coughs> so Peter Leiko, who also works together with Arshak Petrosyan, has very good connections to the Armenian team and is representing Hungary on the top board. Hungary in their match against Romania are small favorites. I mentioned yesterday Hungary, one of my slight underdogs to underdog picks to score a medal because they're a very compact team. Lake on board one is very solid. Rapport can put up big scores on board number two. And then they have the very, very tough players, Zoltan Almashi, Ferenc Berkes on the lower boards. So Hungary, forced to be reckoned with, and Peter Leiko, who no longer has the rating he used to have when he was one of the world's best players, challenged Vladimir Kramnik for the World Championship title in 2004, is still, still stronger than his rating. Don't be fooled by his 2680. This guy works on chess constantly, and on board one, he will be very, very hard to defeat. He, I think, recently has struggled a little bit putting together big scores in open tournaments or in team competitions on lower boards. But on board one, I think it's a good gambit by the Hungarian team to put in on one and not the higher rated Almashi or Rapport, because Leiko is so tough to beat. 
Then we see the Hungarian team facing the Romanian squad that has not changed a lot over the last couple of years. DVD Tennis Piano, who is playing for Germany now, as used to represent Romania, but that's a long time ago. Never since, I believe the top boards have been manned by Konstantin Lupulescu, who's playing against Peter Leiko here. Always around 2.620 till 2.650. And Mircea Paligras on board number two, sporting a similar rating as well, dealing with Richard Rapport. The position in the Leiko game is not out of hand yet, typical structure where Black would rather not have this pawn on b6, leaving some light square weaknesses on the queen side, but White would probably also prefer not to have his pawn on e3 after Fianchetto and his bishop, so he could develop his own bishop to g5 or f4. Therefore, both sides made some small concessions, and a long maneuvering game is on the agenda. Very often, Black will play slowly c6, knight a6, knight c7, or c6, knight bd7, rook e8. And have a look around. Well, for white, it's not completely clear which, which plan to choose. You can try to push up your queenside pawns, you can try to put a knight on e5, you can try to prepare e4. Long story short, I don't really know what to do with white. You know, we'll see if Lupulescu has a concept here. On board number two, Rapport. Oh, similar structure. What's going on? Is Rapport gaining inspiration from Lupulescu? Maybe he didn't feel like doing anything too crazy in the opening. Rapport, of course, known for all kinds of creative setups like c4, followed by e3 and g4. But this time around, maybe he didn't prepare and he thought, I'll just have a look what Lupulescu does on board number one. This guy Lupulescu is a solid player. I'll just mirror it, no matter what my opponent does. And that's sort of what happened. Completely different opening, but they got the same structure. This c takes d5, e takes d5, and a3 leaves black with a choice. He can take on c3. I believe it's a fairly reasonable move here. B takes C and then immediately try to open the position before White is really developed with C5. Or he can try to keep his bishop by playing bishop to E7 or bishop D6 played by Polygrass. And of course bishop D6, we have to ask ourselves, can't you take the pawn on D5? Maybe you can. But probably you would not enjoy your extra pawn all that much. Black has two options. One is bishop b4 check, a takes b4, queen takes d5, and after let's say knight f3, knight to c6, bishop to h3, looks like very good compensation. The other would be bishop takes g3. And once again, trying to maintain an extra pawn looks insanely risky with this king in the center. So even though Rapports likes adventures, I would expect him to play a more quiet move here. One setup you could go for is e3, followed by knight g2, castles, then slowly prepare f3, followed by e4. Now the setup I've seen is knight to h3, intending to go to f4. We shall see what Richard Rapport is up to. On the lower boards, nothing dramatic has happened yet. Almashi, a very solid Joko piano against Bogdan Daniel Deaths. Almashi, 150 points, higher rated roughly here, but of course with the black pieces, it won't be easy to mix it versus that. Apologies if I bungle lots of names, I'm trying my very best. Ferenc Berkes on board number four against Gergely Sabo. Um, a bit of a theoretical debate here in the F3 Nimzo Indian. I believe I covered this in another video series of mine on the Nimzo Indian, this line with e4 castles. And I pointed out that after e5, knight e8, which used to be the main line, it seemed to me that black is doing quite all right. But the move knight to h3, which had been played before by, for example, Pavel Aliano, deserves a very close look. I, if I recall correctly, in my series I gave b takes c, bishop takes c4, and the little trick knight takes d5 here, typical combination. Because after e takes d5, you can go queen h4 check, then grab the bishop. So what white should do instead is bishop takes d5, e takes d, queen takes d5. When the position becomes very, very sharp, very, very quickly. Bishop to a6 is possible, stopping castles, leaving the rook on a8 on priest. Can you do that? Or did I just blunder the rook? That'd be unfortunate. Maybe don't blunder the rook. Maybe start with knight c6. See, that's the danger of... 
not remembering things, but fortunately for me, I don't have to remember stuff uh, because I don't have to play the game. Here, knight c6 looks like a stronger move than bishop a6 after queen takes a8. Anyway, all this, all of this was very, very double-edged. Mm, line where black has to play dynamically because white... Oh, I'm so confused if I'm able to sacrifice that rook or not. But I'm not, right? Bishop a6, queen takes a8. Give me a moment here. Queen h4 check. Maybe that's it. Because I have a strong feeling that it was possible to play bishop a6. This might be it. Queen h4, knight f2, knight to c6. And we trap the queen. And probably black is doing fine. Yeah, that's the way to do it. So after bishop to a6, I believe typically white was not supposed to take on a8, but instead play something like bishop f4 or bishop to g5 with very double-edged position. We'll see. we'll see who has done his homework better here so far. A lot of theoretical action in all these games. Mm, let's have a look at the... Is it on board number three? Doesn't really matter in the second round because all of these teams have won their first match. But yeah, I believe technically it's board number three. And my favorite matchup of the day, Holland or the Netherlands. I'm not sure which one is to be preferred. M versus Ukraine. On board one, we have Anish Giri, who was one of the few players who did not sit out the first round, one of the few top boards that did not sit out the first round. So he's already playing his second game here. Let's hope Anish does not collapse because of all this workload. Well, Pavel Elyanov is freshly rested, did not play in the first game, and now has the not very pleasant task of neutralizing Anish Giri with black. I recall that Anish beat Pavel Elyanov with one e4 while ago in Norway chess, maybe last year's Norway chess. I'm sure they've met over the board after that. And this time around, Anish Giri plays one d4 and decides to go for, or Pavel decides to go for the Queen's Gambit accepted, which has recently been, I'm not sure if revitalized, but reintroduced at the highest level by Fabiano Caruana who normally made not really effortless draws in this position with black after suffering quite a bit. And then Anish, at some point I believe Anish took some notes from Caruana, not literally, and decided, you know, if Fabi does this all the time, then maybe I can try as well. And Anish decided to play the Queen's Gambit declined, later tweeted, thanks Fabiano for inspiration, and Fabiano replied, you normally don't need inspiration to make a draw, Anish. So, a little good-natured back and forth there. Of course, Anish has this slightly drawish reputation, but I still wouldn't enjoy facing him with the black pieces, because Anish is also one of the hardest workers, most prepared people in chess. And I'm slightly curious already, because he chose the move queen to e2, which has not been on the forefront of theoretical debates recently. Most of the debates focus around the moves d takes c5 or b3. A4, also slightly less popular here. Bishop B3 used to be a thing a long time ago, but nowadays D takes C or B3 are all the rage. Queen E2 has always been considered to be okay for black because of an early B5, hitting this bishop, bishop to B3 or bishop to D3, and bishop B7, followed by knight B7. But Ivanish does something. It normally is worth it to pay very close attention. Bishop to D3, Elyanov decides not to start with bishop b7, but with knight bd7. I would go into the subtleties here if I understood them, but I'm not quite sure what that is about. Feels to me like bishop b7. Might be slightly more flexible. Still, knight bd7 played, a4, and c4. This is one of those things, when you're a kid, normally you're taught 